Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel Airbus uh, What's It Doing Now. This is a short video as a tear and share in dispatching with no APU. This occurred uh, uh, for me recently on command line training and it was a great experience and a great opportunity for the new commander uh, to manage a situation that he uh, wasn't expecting at the time. I've got a list of things here that we spoke about and some of the things that we needed or he needed to put in in place uh, to manage the situation and to make sure that the services and facilities were available uh, for us uh, negotiating with operations um, cabin crew ground crew um, and uh, various other services including uh, ATC so we're going to list that um, in, in just a moment and just run through some of the things that you might need uh, to think about like I say it's not an exhaustive list uh, it's much of the stuff that we discussed but of course in your experience if you had any other uh, tips that you wanted to share then please put that in the description um, and in the comment section uh, beneath the video that would be most uh, useful uh, we pressed the start master switch the APU master switch we got a fault light and then the ECAM uh, came up with APU auto shutdown master switch off we tried that a couple of times it wasn't working the, the, the engineer came out did the same thing uh, and then uh, dispatch the aircraft in accordance with the MEL. Um, apparently, when you press the master switch uh, for the APU, it powers up the APU electrical system. It goes through the brains of the computer, which is the ECB from memory, um, and then does a self-test. If that self-test isn't satisfied for whatever reason, an element isn't working, um, then the APU won't start. And that's uh, what happened uh, to us. Now, the MEL gives you a couple of operational procedures there that you need to consider. One of them is the engine start with, a, with an air start unit. And there is a QRH procedure with that, both in the paper and in the electrical electronic QRH, if that's what you're using. And also refueling with an engine running. Uh, and that might be a procedure that um, is within your operations um, and there is a uh, procedure there which talks about making sure passengers are uh, disembarked and um, ATC are aware and fire services etc so you can uh, read through that in uh, in your own time so one of the things we had to think about was uh, the crew briefing. The start was going to be different with starting with an air start unit. Um, it's going to take longer. It's going to sound um, different, of course, with the air start unit. It's quite noisy. And we're starting an engine on stand with a pushback to then start the second engine on the taxi line. The engine's going to be run up to up to 40% N1 to get the necessary bleed. It's all there in the procedure for you. So that's going to be different as well. It's going to take longer. So the cabin crew need to be uh, aware of that. Also, the need on arrival for a ground power uh, for a ground power unit and for the passengers to remain seated until such time as the seatbelt signs are off. That's pretty standard normal operations. But we've all seen it. I've travelled uh, as a passenger and seen passengers stand up even before the aircraft comes to a stop. So the cabin crew need to be brief that the passengers need to be brief and you can also do that as part of your PA which I'll come on to in a moment that the engine will be running when we come on to stand and the parking brakes applied so there's going to be a delay before turning the seatbelt signs off until the ground power unit is attached and the engine is shut down so another thing there for your cabin crew to be aware of also hot and cold air conditioning now at the time for us, it was about 12 or 13 degrees out, so it was relatively mild. Uh, so it wasn't really a consideration for us. Uh, but it might be that you need to have a ground air cart, uh, an air conditioning unit to provide conditioned air, hot or cold, so that the cabin remains uh, comfortable without the APU bleed. Um, if you don't have that, then you might need to discuss ventilation, whether you have the door open, door uh, one and two left, for example, make sure there are some steps there and discuss ways with the cabin crew and how to keep uh, the cabin uh, as ventilated uh, as possible. It comes on then to the uh, passenger briefing, and that's broadly the same as what you would say uh, uh, to, the, to the cabin crew. So the need to remain seated as the aircraft uh, engines will be running when we come on to stand. 
Now, we chose to do that as part of our sort of goodbye briefing as we came uh, into the approach before we started our descent. And then uh, the captain elected to remind the passengers as we were taxiing in. So that takes a little bit of careful management as well in terms of time and making sure you're familiar with taxi routine before one of you goes off uh, to talk to the uh, passengers. Um, but a, a useful reminder uh, to the passengers as you're taxiing in, because many of them uh, will uh, will have forgotten. The briefing to operations as well, particularly in our case where this happened, um, it wasn't already in the tech log, so our operations and technical MOC weren't aware of it uh, until such time as the engineer attended. So we asked them to call ahead to make sure that there was a ground power unit and the air start unit was going to be available for our turnaround and critically that someone was ready with the ground power unit uh, as we arrived so that we could minimize the impact of the operation and also minimize the time that it would take for us to be able to shut down uh, the remaining engine. Now your handling agent uh, will be able to help with that as well and you can send the information over via ACARS and inform them uh, all of the above. So the handling agent at the your, your point of departure should notify the handling agent at your point of arrival of any special assistance that's required and also operationally any services the aircraft requires, including ground power and um, air start unit. But again, send an ACARS message ahead of time. All this is just sort of belt and braces, really. In an ideal world, operations would sort it all out for you, but it, the message doesn't always get across uh, and, you know, people are busy and sometimes it doesn't get there. And you really need those services when you arrive. Air traffic control was another thing that we discussed as well, because of course we're starting an engine on stand and that's gonna be negotiated by delivery or uh, ground or apron control. And particularly when you're starting an engine uh, on the taxi line, it needs to be uh, cleared behind. And there are certain parts of the airport that just won't permit that. Uh, uh, and so that just needs a little bit of uh, careful management. Maybe not permit that isn't quite accurate, but there might be some things that need to be put in place to make the area behind the aircraft uh, safe. And also with your ground crew in how you manage that as well, like making sure the parking brake is set and the pushback uh, tug is clear before you then go and run up um, that uh, other engine. So a little bit of management and careful uh, ATC and ground crew uh, coordination is going to be uh, required there. It might be that, as it was in our case, a delay to the to this push purely because, or delay to the start while they're organising um, uh, it to be clear behind the aircraft to facilitate that uh, cross bleed start. Um, and then, of course, it comes on to the pilot uh, crew uh, flight deck briefing. Um, like this isn't necessarily in order, but you know, you, this, this this might come as your first part of your brief, I don't know. Um, but there's other things for us to think about operationally, as well as getting all those services and, and, and passengers and ATC and cabin crew notified. But it's also our lack of redundancy. Uh, we don't have the um, APU uh, electrical services, uh, AC power. We also don't have bleeds. So we've lost a bit of redundancy there if we were to lose an AC power supp uh, supply such as a, a generator. And also, God forbid, if we were to lose both uh, engines, then in terms of APU assisted start wouldn't be available to us either. So just some extra things there uh, to think about in terms of uh, loss of redundancy. Uh, there might be some airports you go to. Uh, one that springs to mind for me uh, is Innsbruck. I don't do the Innsbruck flights, uh, but some of you watching this here might do. And I believe uh, that um, it's advisable to have the APU available in order to, to provide bleed to the engines or to take the bleed from the engines uh, to provide air conditioning so that in the event of a go around, the best possible climb gradient is attained. Um, uh, and that's that might be a prerequisite uh, or it might just be uh, um, advisable operations, a recommended procedure. But just check, this, this channel goes out to um, airline crew all over the world. So um, some of you might be uh, more terrain uh, specific or uh, sensitive uh, than other parts of uh, Europe, uh, perhaps. And this might be a procedure or it might be a prerequisite before operating. So obviously do bear that in mind. Also think about the workload that's involved because referring to the QRH for something that you don't normally do very often is going to increase the workload. So think about how ways in which you can mitigate that and help with that uh, areas of high workload and how, you, how you're going to manage this uh, checklist uh, as a crew. 
And then lastly, think about the delays due to faulty or uh, unavailable uh, equipment. Again, this needs managing with time and manage expectations as well. The push is going to take longer. Um, the, the, the day is going to be a little bit longer and it's going to be um, a, a little bit more hassle for you as well, ultimately. Also think about equipment which is faulty. So it won't be the first time that I've carried out this procedure uh, and dispatched with an operative APU. Uh, and many of you will be the same. Um, where you have an air start unit that just simply doesn't produce the power that you need. Um, uh, and it might be that two had to be operated in parallel or you simply had to find another air start unit. And that's never easy in my experience. I mean, it's taken up to about 30 minutes to find another air start unit um, because they're not all used all the time. And one of them might mean to be dragged out to the other part of the airfield uh, before it gets to you. So. Uh, that's going to take some time. So uh, manage uh, expectations. So guys, listen, that's that's basically it. I just wanted to um, give you uh, just a bit of a heads up if you're operating without uh, an auxiliary power unit, some of the things that you might need to think about. Um, and it, as I say, it's it's not exhaustive. Um, it, I probably haven't included absolutely everything, but some of the main things, which include the briefing for the crew, the passenger briefing, operations briefing, air traffic control, and the briefing between uh, the two crew, which includes the operational procedures and, of course, uh, what to do the, in the event of um, and lack of uh, redundancy and management of faulty equipment and, and basically managing to get all those services available for you and ready uh, for you for your dispatch and obviously for your arrival. Hopefully that's helpful. Thanks very much for tuning in. Um, stay safe. Keep the plate spinning and I'll see you again uh, for another episode uh, very soon. Thanks very much.